Hello everybody and welcome to the second video of the evolution unit. So in this video we're going to be discussing the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And what the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium states is that the genetic population, uh, sorry, the genetic makeup of a population will not change unless one of five different outside forces acts on it. So let's get going and explore this further. Okay, so before we get going, there's some vocabulary uh, words that you've seen, you might have seen before already in this unit, but I want to review because they're important for this section going forward. So first, remember that evolution is whenever we see a change in the heritable traits of a population. So in other words, if a population um, changes in the traits that it has, that can be considered to be evolution. Remember, a population is a group of individuals of the same species that live in the same space and at the same time. And it's the smallest unit that can evolve. So a population might be a group of frogs that all live in one pond together. And there might be a second population of frogs you know, somewhere else in that same state. Um, when we say this is the smallest unit that can evolve, it means that Populations can change their genetic makeup. No one individual can change their genetic makeup, but a population can. Um, and a third vocab word here is a gene pool. So this is a new word. And it's basically at the total collection of a genes in a given population. So if I were looking at my population of frogs, and if I took all of their genes and considered them together, that would be the gene pool. So as I alluded to at the beginning of the video, what we're going to be talking about in this video is the Hardy-Weinberg genetic equilibrium. And what this basically says is that if a population um, does not have an outside force acting on it, the frequency of the allele, so the frequency of certain genes in a population will remain the same until an outside force acts upon it. So for example, if we were looking at our population of frogs from the previous slide, if those frogs, if 50% of them were brown and 50% of them were green, they would stay 50% brown and 50% green unless there was some outside force that acted and caused the population to change. If, if, if the population, if there's not a change in heritable, heritable traits in the population, that population is not evolving. So Hardy-Weinberg said that there are five things that can, that can act as this out, outward, outward force. In other words, there are five things that can cause change in a population. So one of them we know. One of them is natural selection. However, the other four are going to be new in this video. Um, the first one is small populations and genetic drift. The second is known as migration or gene flow. The third is mutations. And the last one is non-random mating, or what we call sexual selection. So we're going to explore each of these um, in this video. Okay, so let's start first with genetic drift. So genetic drift is the change in the gene pool of a population due to chance. And I'm putting a box around this word chance because that's the really important point here. So you can kind of think natural, natural selection is when a population changes because some individuals are more fit. They're more adapted to survive. Genetic drift is when certain individuals survive and pass their traits on because they're lucky. It's totally by chance. It's totally random. And the smaller a population is, the more impact genetic drift will have on it. Okay? And it's basically the idea that, uh, that alleles or, or traits will be lost just by chance. Um, and this can reduce genetic diversity. So there are two types we're going to explore. We're going to look at the bottleneck effect and the founder effect. Okay, so let me give you a general example first, and then we'll look into the founder effect and the bottleneck effect. So imagine I have a population of beetles. So some are green and some are brown. It looks about one-third green and two-thirds brown. And then some guy comes by, and he doesn't see the beetles, and he accidentally steps on a bunch of them, okay? And just by chance, he happened to kill more green beetles than brown beetles. So now my population is more brown and less green than it was before. Now, this is not natural selection because the green beetles were, I mean, sorry, the brown beetles were not more fit. They didn't have better genes. Their genes didn't help them survive. The green ones just got really unlucky. So in genetic drift, the survivors are luckier, not fitter. So the first type, it's called the bottleneck effect. And this is actually what I just described in the beetle example. 
the, so the bottleneck effect is a type of genetic drift that leads to a loss of genetic diversity because the population is, is greatly reduced. So usually there's some catastrophic event, like an earthquake or a flood or a fire, and it kills off most of the population, leaving behind a small surviving population. But usually when you only have a few individuals remaining, usually they are not going to have the same genetic makeup as the original population. So just by chance, the survivors have a different set of genes than the original population did um, originally. Okay, so an example is elephant seals were hunted to near extinction. Um, there's only about, there are less than about 100 of them in the 1700s and 1800s. And the seals that were not killed did, did not have, were not a good representation of the original genetic makeup of the seal population. And therefore, when they reproduced and had offspring, um, their population wasn't very diverse, which means current seals have almost no genetic diversity now. Okay. So here's an example. Imagine I have a population of some, of some organism that's represented by these different colored beads. Some terrible thing happens, maybe a hurricane or a fire. Most of them are killed, and the ones that are surviving just by chance are mostly purple. So now my remaining population looks nothing like my original population um, because the ones that survived by chance, because it's such a small number, it does not represent the original genetic diversity that existed. Okay. So the second type of genetic drift is called the founder effect. And this is basically the idea that a few individuals break off and separate from a population and colonize a new habitat. And because only a small group of individuals is leaving, they do not represent the, enti the entirety of the genetic diversity that existed in the original population. So their new group, the new population that they found, hence the name founder effect, does not represent the same population as the original. And the smaller the group that, that colonizes the new area, the more different their gene pool will be from the original population. So we look at an example here. If I have some population of beetles that all live together, and a few of them get separated from the rest and go and, and, and reproduce and start their own new colony, this new population of beetles is not the same as the original one. So now I have a change in my population just because by chance the ones that left were not a good representation of the whole population because they were such a small group. Similarly, if I had a second small set of beetles get separated and found their own population, you can see my new populations are very different now. They're very diverse. There's been no natural selection here. It's just, just by chance, the ones that left to go found their own group did not represent the original population. So our second factor is known as gene flow or migration. And basically the idea of gene flow is the movement of fertile individual or gametes. So you can think of like gametes or egg and sperm. So pollen is um, plant sperm, for example. Spores are the reproductive cells of many fun fungi. Um, if, so you have movements of fertile individuals between populations. So imagine if I have a brown beetle population and a green beetle population, and one of the brown beetles migrates and joins the green population, well now I have a different set of alleles because the brown beetle has joined them. So here, I have a change in my population's genes, but it's not because of natural selection, it's because there was some gene flow, there was some migration between two populations. And this tends to reduce the differences between a population. So you can imagine if I have some brown beetles moving into the green po beetle population and some green beetles moving into the brown beetle population, soon these two populations are gonna look more similar to one another. So the third factor that can affect the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, or in other words, the third factor that can ca cause change in a population is mutations. Now we already know this word. So remember that a mutation is a change in the nucleotide sequence of DNA, and it's the ultimate source. It's where all new genetic variation and all new alleles come from. So imagine I have two green beetles, and when they are reproducing, one of them has a mutation in either their egg or their sperm cell that makes one of the new offspring beetles brown. Okay, so because this new is brand new mutation that created an allele that's never been seen before, it's going to introduce um, variation in our population. Okay, so most of the time mutations, they very, very rarely um, are helpful to an individual. So they very rarely uh, improve the adaptation of its bearer to the environment. So most of the time they have little to no effect on the gene pool. 
However, occasionally, if the environment is changing and they just happen to, by chance, randomly get a mutation that can help them, um, that could be a huge advantage or a huge disadvantage depending on what kind of mutation they have. So the fourth one, um, natural selection, we already know this one, so I'm not going to go into it really at all. But remember, natural selection is when a, the environment changes, you know, we get a struggle for existence, and then a favorable trait, um, those who have favorable traits live longer, survive, have more offspring, and that trait becomes more frequent in the population. So we already know this one. And then finally, the last thing that can introduce change in a population, or the last thing that can disrupt the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, is called non-random mating or sexual selection. Now, sexual selection, you're going to realize, sounds an awful lot like natural selection. Really, it's just a type of natural selection. So it's a form of natural selection in which individuals with certain characteristics are more likely than others to obtain mates. So you can think natural selection means if you have certain traits, you're going to survive longer and have more offspring. Sexual selection means if you have certain traits, it's going to be easier for you to get a mate. And if it's easier for you to get a mate, you're going to have more offspring. Okay? Um... This sexual selection leads to this idea of what we call sexual dimorphism, which basically means that female and male organisms look different um, because, you know, depending on what females desire in a male or males desire in a female, um, they're going to um, prefer or, or select for different traits in the opposite gender. She would things of like, the size of the different genders, like male lions have manes, male goats tend to have horns, that kind of thing. So there are two types of sexual selection. There's intrasexual selection, which usually means that it's some trait that members of the same sex, which usually males, are using to compete to access for mates. You can think of um, a, a big horned sheep you know, the sheep that has the biggest horns is going to be able to be the best fighter and fight other males and therefore gain access to the um, breeding females. So that trait would follow intrasexual selection. Intersexual selections are traits that um, individuals, usually, fema usually females, um, use to select their male mate. Um, so you can think of maybe females only mate with the fish that have the brightest colored scales. So therefore, the males with the brightest colored scales um, would, sir, would, would have more offspring. So color of scales would follow intersexual selection because it's, it's an example of mate choice. So, I have, so it turns out because um, the traits that are helpful for sexual selection are really only helpful in certain ways, sometimes it can produce these extreme features, and this might actually be harmful to survival. So I have two examples. So the antlers of deer um, is an example of intrasexual selection because the, the male deer who have the largest antlers are more likely to beat out the other male, male deer and therefore get a mate. However, sometimes deer get antlers that are so big that it's actually hard for them to hold up their head. So often it's helpful for mating, but not really helpful for survival. So another one, male peacocks have these ridiculously huge tails because it is an example of intersexual selection. You know, the bigger and flashier a peacock's tail is, the more female birds will want to mate with it. However, these tails slow them down and make it really easy for their predators, which are um, tigers, to catch and eat them. Um, so again, helpful for mating, not so helpful for surviving. So that's it for Hardy Weinberg, and I'll see you in the next video.